BestBookBits.com presents Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain From Disorder by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Published in 2012 and weighing 544 pages. A book on how some systems actually benefit from disorder. In Anti-Fragility, Nassim offers a definite solution. How to gain from disorder and chaos while being protected from fragilities and adverse events. For what he calls anti-fragile is one step beyond robust, as it benefits from adversity, uncertainty, and stresses. Just as human bones get stronger when subjected to stress and tension, Talib stands uncertainty on its head, making it desirable and postponing that things be built in an anti-fragile manner. Extremely ambitious and multidisciplinary, anti-fragility provides a blueprint for how to behave and thrive in a world we don't understand and which is too uncertain for us to even try to understand. He who is not anti-fragile will perish. The book summary can be found on our website, bestbookbits.com. So without further ado, I bring the book summary of Anti-Fragile. The Anti-Fragile. The central theme of the book is anti-fragility, which Talib defines in the prologue. Some things benefit from shocks. They thrive and grow when exposed to volatility, randomness and disorder, and stresses and love adventure, risk and uncertainty. Yet in spite of the ubiquity of the phenomenon, there is no word for the exact opposite of fragile. Let us call it anti-fragile. Anti-fragility is is beyond resilience or robustness. The resilient resists shock and stays the same. The anti-fragile gets better. Another way to formulate it is, anything that has a more upside than downside from random events, shocks, an egg will not benefit from having a five lab weight put on it, but your body can become stronger through similar stresses. This builds on the arguments in Black Swan. Where there's a Black Swan event, the anti-fragile can thrive. But the fragile will frequently perish. Put another way, the anti-fragile can benefit from positive black swans. Fragility implies more to lose than to gain, equals more downside than upside, equals unfavorable asymmetry. Anti-fragility implies more to gain than to lose, equals more upside than downside, equals favorable asymmetry. Damocles, Phoenix, and Hydra. Taleb uses ancient examples to explain the triad of fragile, robust, and anti-fragile. Damocles, who dines with a sword dangling over his head, is fragile. A small stress to the string holding the sword would kill him. The Phoenix who dies and is reborn from its ashes is robust. It always returns to the same state when suffering a massive stressor. But the Hydra, demonstrates anti-fragility. When one head is cut off, two grow back. Nature. Nature is a recurring demonstration of anti-fragility. When you lift weights, your body adapts to lift heavier weights next time. But for human systems, we tend to fight the last war, building a nuclear power plant that can withstand the worst earthquake that we've ever seen. The Streisand Effect and Criticism. This is also demonstrated in the Streisand effect, where the desire to kill an idea can directly lead to its proliferation. Banned books are a good example, or the popularity of Anne Rand despite her aggressive detractors. Or try not to think of a white elephant and see what happens. Fragile and anti-fragile jobs. Talib also shows the dichotomy between certain lines of work and their fragility. As an author, for example, nothing he can do that generates attention will reduce the sale of his books. However, if you were a mid-level executive employee at some bank, if you punch out an annoying drunk in a bar, you will likely get fired, get an arrest record, and be unhorrible. You're extremely fragile. And then again, at the lower end of the spectrum, say as a taxi driver, you have more freedom again because you are not so dependent on your reputation. He also provides a heuristic. People who don't seem to care how they dress or look are robust or anti-fragile. People who have to wear suits and ties worry about a bad reputation are fragile. Domain dependence. Sometimes we understand something in one area, but fail to carry over the underlying logic in another domain. Many statisticians understand statistics, but still get tripped up by simple thought experiments. People will take an elevator to the gym to use the Stairmaster. 
While we understand the benefits of stress in medicine and health, we fail to carry it over to other parts of life. Small stresses on your income can be good for keeping you from accumulating silent risk or becoming cocky. Small fights in your relationship can help it become stronger and avoid big fights. The Procrustean Bed Tell abusers the Procrustean Bed story to demonstrate how we create harm by reducing variations. Procrustiates would capture travelers and put them in his bed, stretching them on a rack if they were too short for it or chopping off their extremities if they were too tall. When we destroy variation to fit a model, we do similar harm. The turkey problem. A bigger theme in the black swan, but the turkey problem is how you can imagine a turkey raised and fed from birth, becoming more sure every day that it will continue to be well fed and taken care of based on its past evidence right up until Thanksgiving. Boridan's donkey. A donkey equally hungry and thirsty, stuck between a bale of hay and water will die of starvation and thirst, unable to make a decision between the two. However, a random nudge in one direction will solve the problem for him. Randomness can help with decision making and becoming unstuck. But when we try to reduce it, we lose the beneficial stressor. Stoicism. Talib invokes stoic principles on multiple occasions as ways of handling randomness and becoming more anti-fragile. For example, success can make you fragile because you now have much more to lose than you did before. You're afraid of becoming poor. The stoic technique of practicing poverty helps reduce your fragility from being afraid of losing your wealth. Hormias, small stresses, and inverse Hormias. Hormias is another example of anti-fragility. By taking small doses of poison, you can develop more immunity to it. Just as vaccinations use a small dose of a disease to train your body to resist its stronger form. We see similar anti-fragile benefits from fasting, weightlifting, running. And we also see that depriving systems of these beneficial stresses is harmful, as is evidenced by any person who has never been hungry or never exercised. Aging, Talib argues, is hastened by a lack of stress. We are living longer, but people are more sick. All of our comfort has been detrimental to our health spans. We thought aging causes bone degradation, but it seems that bone degradation causes aging. Competition. This can also be applied to competition. The best horses lose when they compete with slower ones and win against stronger rivals. Absence of challenge can degrade the best of us. Absence of challenge can degrade the best of us. Distraction. Another example, static background noise makes it easy to pick up radio signals. Riding in cafes with background conversations helps you focus. We want a little stress, but not too much. Moods. Talib also points out how many people are being put on antidepressants and how mood swings are a natural part of the human condition. If someone is truly suicidal, sure, but the ability to wrestle with our dark side is a part of life and a great inspiration for creatives. Language. He also points out how real language learning is done in the wild suffering embarrassment for not knowing things and struggling to be understood. It is not done through textbooks and tests, as is evidenced by any child learning their first language. Problems with modern tea. Talib points out numerous problems with the modern life, mostly arising from removing the natural stresses that help us. Lions in the zoo. Consider the life of a lion in a zoo and in the wild. The lion in the zoo might live longer, but is that really a desirable existence? Tully points out that we used to have free-range humans before such things as suits and soccer mums and gym machines. Native intervention and iatrogenics. There's a mistaken desire to intervene, particularly from doctors, that can lead to iatrogenics, which means harm caused by the healer. Harm from the doctors accounts for more deaths than any single cancer. There are two forms, the obvious iatrogenics, such as amputating the wrong leg, and the non-obvious iatrogenics, such as carelessly prescribing antidepressants and ADHD medication. The agency problem. Part of the issue comes from the agency problem where the agent, doctor, has different interest from the receiver of his services, the patient. Editing. 
Talib shares a story of his article being aggressively edited for writing style by the Washington Post. So he pulled it and gave it to the Financial Times, who only made one edit to correct a date. He points out that the WAPO, in trying to over-edit, missed the only important error. Good procrastination. Talib points out that the procrastination is not always bad. It is something deep within us that is able to identify the urgency of a problem. We don't procrastinate when a line is attacking, but procrastinating, responding to an email, is probably fine. Related, the cure to procrastination on the job is not to force yourself to create systems that fix it, rather to find an occupation where you do not have to fight your impulses and where you do not procrastinate. The barbell and the bimodal strategy. The barbell demonstrates an anti-fragile balance. The idea of the two extremes kept separate with avoidance in the middle. This represents playing it very safe in some areas, staying robust to negative black swans and taking a lot of small risks in another area, open to positive black swans, to take advantage of anti-fragility while avoiding being in the middle. If you put 90% of your net worth in cash or T-bills and use the other 10% for extremely aggressive and risky investments, you can never lose more than 10% of your net worth. But if you're exposed to massive upside, or you can take a very safe day job while you work on your literature, you balance the extreme randomness and riskiness of a writing career with a safe job. Or you do a serial barbell where you have pure action and pure reflection. Seneca and Montagain. More examples do crazy things, break furniture once in a while, like the Greeks during the last later stages of a drinking synopsis, and stay rational in larger decisions. Trashy gossip magazines and classics or sophisticated works never middle brow stuff. Talk to either undergraduate students, cab drivers and gardeners, or the highest caliber scholars, never to middling but career conscious academics. If you dislike someone, leave him alone or eliminate him. Don't attack him verbally. Optionality. Talib discusses optionality, freedom of choice as a means of robustness and anti-fragility. Simply, the more options you have, the more freedom you have to respond to unforeseen circumstances and the less fragile you are to sudden events. Financial independence is a big form of it, but there are others. Certain fields do not have negative forms, there's no opposite of someone buying your book. So the authors have more options because they have less downside. Tinkering. Talib is a big proponent of trial and error, which he calls tinkering as a way to figure things out and expose yourself to large potential upsides. Many great inventions were toys first. The steam engine was invented by the Greeks for amusement, and it took a long time for us to realize it had practical applications. The teleological fallacy, the error that you know where you were going and that you knew exactly where you were going in the past and the others had succeeded in the past by knowing where they were going. One form of this is teaching birds how to fly, where Talib points out that a Harvard orthological department could explain the mathematics of flight and how birds' wings work, but the birds do not need to understand that in order to fly. Talib also argues against the master-pupil relationship, arguing that those relationships developed because the people were like-minded, not that they became like-minded because of the relationship. A personal note on this, I've come to believe more and more that the right books and idea is not about completely teaching you something new, rather helping you fully articulate something that you already began to think about. The Green Lumber Fallacy Talib tells a story of someone who traded green lumber and made a considerable profit from it, while tinkering that green lumber was literally logs painted green, not knowing it was fresh wood. But not knowing this fact did not affect his ability to trade it effectively. So when we assume some information is necessary and important, when it really isn't, we're committing the green lumber fallacy. As another formulation, you do not need to understand aerodynamics or physics to ride a bicycle. Some rules for optionality. Number one, look for optionality and rank things according to their optionality. Number two, look for things with open-ended, not closed-ended payoffs. 
And three, do not invest in business plans, but in people. People who could change careers six or seven times. And number four, make sure you are barbelled, whatever that means in your business. Non-linearity. For the fragile, the cumulative effect of small shocks is smaller than the single effect of a single large shock. For the anti-fragile, shocks bring more benefits or less harm as their intensity increases up to a point. Example, lifting a 100 pounds weight once is more beneficial than lifting a one pound weight a 100 times. Your flight never gets in four hours early, but you can certainly arrive four hours late. Anything unexpected, any shock, is much more likely to extend the total flying time. Ergo, flight schedules are fragile. Another example, don't cross a river if it's on average four feet deep. Via negativa, by removal. Talib argues that the solution to many problems in life is by removing things, not adding them. By removing things, not adding them. Decision making. If you have more than one reason to do something, don't do it. By invoking more than one reason to do something, you are trying to convince yourself to do it. Obvious decisions, robust errors, require no more than one good reason. The Lindy Effect. For the perishable food and humans, every additional day in its life means it is closer to dying. For the non-perishable books, ideas, every additional day of its life can imply a longer life expectancy. If a book has been in print for 100 years, it will likely continue to be read for another 100 years. But a person who has been alive for 100 years? Hmm? Nomania. There is a class of things, typically technology, where they're obsessed by having the newest version of it. For the classical art, literature works that have endured older tens to be better. You'll likely replace your phone every two years, but not the painting on your wall. Medicine. There's no good evidence for the benefits of reducing swelling, but we automatically do it as part of the reflex to do something. There are also causes where we get small, immediate benefits and ignore the unknown larger side effects down the line. This would include drugs like thalidomide and nutritional interventions like trans fat. When we find something that seems to have a free lunch, like steroids or trans fat, something that helps the healthy without a clear downside, it is likely there will be a concealed trap somewhere. It's a sucker's bet. Some more real and potent examples. Viax, an anti-inflammatory medicine that ends up causing heart issues. Barbaric surgery for overweight people in place of dieting. Antidepressants in non-suicidal cases. Cortisone disinfectants and other cleaning products, hormone replacement therapy, hysterectomies, cesarean births, when the mother won't otherwise die, whitening of rice, wheat, sunscreen, excessive hygiene, not eating dirt, high fructose corn syrup, soy milk, child psychiatry. He specifies though that iatrogenics is only a concern when someone is not terminal. If they are at the risk of death, iatrogenics don't matter. It's the little unnecessary interventions that are problematic. He also specifies that what Mother Nature does and has done is rigorous until proven otherwise. But what humans do is flawed until proven otherwise. Nature's fats turn out to be very healthy. Human design ones, not so much. Treating the tumor that will not kill you shortens your life since chemotherapy is toxic. Diet. Drink no liquid that isn't at least a thousand year old. Wine, water, or coffee. Eat nothing invented or re-engineered by humans. While consuming plants, they would have been regular, meat irregular. So it won't make sense to eat mostly plant-based most of the time, then feast on meat intermittently. In nature, we have to expend energy to eat. Lions do not eat, then hunt for fun. Fasting is quite good for us and natural. We do not need to load up on food before doing something. Rather, refeed after. Other removals. I would add that in my own experience, a considerable jump in my personal health has been achieved by removing offensive irradiance. The morning newspaper, the boss, the daily commute, air conditioning, though not heating, television, 
emails from documentary filmmakers, economic forecast, news about the stock market, gym strength training, machines, and many more. Wealth. He also points out that the ill health and early death of many rich people and argues if true wealth consists in worryless sleeping, clear conscience, reciprocal gratitude, absence of envy, good appetite, muscle strength, physical energy, frequent laughs, no meals alone, no gym class, some physical labor or hobby, good bowel movements, no meeting rooms, and periodic surprises, then it is largely subtractive. Elimination of iatrogenics. The ethics of fragility and anti-fragility. Two rules for the skin in the game. Number one, never get on a plane if the pilot is not on board. And number two, make sure there is also a co-pilot. Another rule, never ask anyone for their opinion, forecast, or recommendation. Just ask them what they have or don't have in their portfolio. Watch what people do, not what they say. Watch what people do, not what they say. Many researchers on happiness are earning more than $70,000 a year, despite their own research saying it won't make them any happier. Only large corporations can afford to sell you things that kill you. Small ones go bust too easily. So there is a risk from taking advice and products that could not survive on small scales. Something being marketed is necessarily inferior. Otherwise, it would not need to be aggressively marketed. Marketing beyond conveying information is insecurity. The pursuit of meaning within big data has brought about many more spurious and random relationships than meaningful understanding. The false relationships will grow much faster than the real ones, simply because the chance allows so many more of them to be found. Quotations. Wind extinguishes a candle and energizes fire. If you see a fraud and do not say fraud, you are a fraud. A man is morally free when he judges the world and judges other men with uncompromising certainty. If humans fight the last war, nature fights the next one. Ancestral life has no homework, no boss, no civil servants, no academic grades, no conversation with the dean, no consultation with an MBA, no table of procedure, no application form, no trip to New Jersey, no grammatical stickler, no conversation with someone boring you, all life was random stimuli, and nothing, good or bad, ever felt like work. Dangerous yet, but boring. Never. This is a central illusion in life, that randomness is risky, that it is a bad thing, and that eliminating randomness is done by eliminating randomness. Convincing and confident disciplines, says physics, tend to use little statistical backup, while political science and economics, which has never produced anything of note, are full of elaborate statistics and statistical evidence. And you know that once you remove the smoke, the evidence is not evidence. The situation in science is similar to detective novels, in which the person with the largest number of alibis turns out to be the guilty one. I derive the rule that which is called healthy is generally unhealthy, just as social networks are anti-social, and the knowledge-based economy is typically ignorant. The best way to justify that you are alive is by checking if you like variations. Remember that food would not have taste if it were not for hunger. Results are meaningless without effort, joy without sadness, convictions without uncertainty, and an ethical life isn't so when stripped of personal risks. And that's a wrap on Anti-Fragile by Nassim Nicholas Talib. Subscribe to our channel now for future summaries and check out our website, bestbookbits.com, for the written summary and more. To buy the book, use our web and hundreds more to browse and purchase. Thanks for watching and I hope you learned a thing or two about Anti-Fragile. Have yourself an amazing day and stay tuned for more.